Hey everyone, welcome. This is Diana Rowan. And today we are going to be talking about why you need two practice plans, not just one. So as everybody is coming in, yeah, I would love to know where you're coming in from. Hey, Pacific Northwest, wonderful. Welcome, Martha. I'm looking forward to sharing this. And who else do we have? Uh, San Pedro, Northern Ontario, wonderful. Just uh, <laughs> all over the world. I just, I just can't get it. I still get a thrill, I think, from just how global we can be. You know, I'm sitting here in my living room in Berkeley, California. Here, here are all of you. I love it. Hey, Susan from San Francisco, close by. Yeah. So today we are going to talk about the two different types of practice plan and why you actually need two different types of practice plan. And a lot of the reason why I wanted to um, wanted to share this with you is that it has made such a big difference in my life to have completely different approaches to learning versus performing. And we're going to get into that today a lot. So as you know, you know, we've been working through this uh, system that I basically use called the uh, Bright Knowledge System. I created this over a period of many years of experimentation, both on myself and as a teacher. And I found that basically to be creative and follow through on your heart goals, there are these five sequential steps that you, you actually have to go through in a linear fashion. I'm not such a linear person, but this, these five steps, they are linear. And let me show you a little bit what this looks like. This is probably starting to look familiar to you. So on the outside of the circle, you'll see that there are these five steps, starting with the purpose, then moving on to setting your goals, and today we're on the third step. The third step is setting up your practice plan. Now, if you missed previous masterclasses on finding your purpose, that was a super fun one with Boris Goldman, or setting your heart goals, um, you can always watch them later on, on my official page, so the Bright Knowledge Academy page um, under my name, Diana Rowan. And uh, so you can rewatch those. And I definitely recommend you do that because this is sequential. It does start with your purpose. That's what defines everything. Most people want to start here on step three. They want to create a practice plan in the beginning, but that's actually a mistake because most likely if you do that, you're setting up a practice plan that's not in line with your greatest desires, beliefs, values, feelings, um, and it just sets you up basically for learning stuff that you are not um, not in love with. And if you're not, it's very hard to follow through on those. Hey, Sally from Wisconsin. Yeah. Hey, everybody. So um, if you aren't hearing any sound, I think there's a little icon that you can see. Um, of course, you can't hear me say this. <laughs> but maybe if someone could type that in. Um, that would help. So uh, if someone yeah, could type in, um, look for a little sound icon, a little broadcast icon, and uh, click on that, and the sound will come up for you. Sharon from North Carolina. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, thank you, guys. All right. So um, I would love to know, before we get started, um, do you have a practice plan in the first place? Do you have one? Um, so a practice plan means something, a plan, basically, that you have for each practice session. It would be a plan that you can follow through on. It's written down. That's absolutely the best way to do it, not just trying to keep it in your head. And it's something that you can keep referring back to that elaborates on your goals, so we first talked about defining our purpose. Then we set some goals based on those purposes. Now, what are we going to do in terms of manifesting those goals? But well, we need a practice plan. And not only do we need one, but we need two. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So let me know in the comments below, do you have, do you have a practice plan right now? Or do you just sort of sit down at the harp and start playing? So let's uh, let's hear from Anita. 
nothing concrete. I just practice six to seven days a week. So Anita, this is a very common approach. Um, the thing is, by actually having a plan, you would be amazed at the progress that you make. It actually speeds up a lot. And, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But when you write things down, there's almost a magical thing that happens where it becomes very clear what the next steps are to do. I think it's very easy for us to actually just sit down and we, we're almost a little bit on automatic pilot or we think we're doing something and we're not. We think we're practicing a piece, but in fact, we only spent two minutes on it. It may feel like an eternity, but we only spent two minutes. And our practice plan will really help you uh, fill in those gaps and also know what steps to take in the first place. So Sandra's saying she just sits down and starts practicing. Okay, so a practice plan for me is something that you actually write down. It's a daily template in many ways that elaborates on your goals. So before I get into that, actually we have one more comment from Gloria. No practice plan, just practice the pieces of music that I'm working on, like five pieces now. I guess I should formulate one. Fabulous, yeah, let's talk about that today. Um, cool. And Yvette, Yvette does have a practice plan, cool. Cool. Yvette, could you share with us in the comments below what that practice plan looks like? I'd love to I'd love to see. Uh, hope you don't mind me putting you on the spot here. <laughs> it's just such an important topic. I mean, practice is actually how we learn. It's actually how we play the harp. It's by doing, not just thinking about it, that we master our instrument, that we get to know our instrument in the first place. Uh, practice is where you are your teacher. And ultimately, you are always your own teacher. Um, although I teach my students, I, I actually am not implanting anything in their brains. I'm just saying, can you consider this? Can I point you in this direction? Have you thought about that? And then they try these things on for size and they learn them. So actually, they are their teacher. And of course, they spend much more time with themselves than I spend with them. So they're a very powerful teacher to themselves. So oh, one more comment, I just love the comments. You know, as we share our experiences with each other, I think we feel not alone. And many people, especially harpists, because we play such a rare instrument and sometimes you guys are uh, the only harpist in town. Um, we can start getting into sort down on ourselves in a certain way. And when we share this knowledge together, I feel like it's really uplifting because you could see that, you know, most people don't create practice plans. That's not a, you haven't done anything wrong necessarily, but we're going to work on that together. So um, let's see what Linda says. I developed one a practice plan in April that I am still using as a framework for my practice. Super. Yes. Linda is there in Lawton, Oklahoma. And uh, one more comment. One more. Uh, Ginny says, I have exercises given to me by my teacher that I use as a warm up. And then I begin playing the piece of music that I'm working on. Yeah. I mean, that is a, a bare bones of a practice plan. It is definitely a plan. And so we're going to talk about that plan that you have there, Ginny, and elaborate a little bit on it. So, oh, Barbara can't hear. Um, so let me just throw this. There's a little icon at the bottom of the video screen to turn the audio on. So try that. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's see. Not only do you have a practice plan, but on a scale of one to five, one is kind of, it's a bummer. Five is, is blazingly great. Can you rate your current practice results. So what I want to hear is how do you feel about your progress in terms of your practice right now? So one would be on the lower end. I don't feel satisfied at all. I feel kind of stuck. Five means my practice is just stellar. I feel great. I feel like I'm making the progress that I want to. So if you could let me know on a scale of one to five, um, and Anita's giving a three here. 
And while people are thinking about this, uh, one more comment from Susan. My practice plan is more than I generally have time for each day. So I do different parts of it on various days. I'm still trying to get the plan more clear. Great. And Gloria has a four, so pretty good, pretty good on her progress. Uh, Sandra's giving it a two. Okay, so we're kind of all over the place, really. Um, so we don't have any anybody who's completely unhappy, but we don't have anybody who's thrilled either. So Ginny's giving it a four. Super. Now, I want you to think about this next question on a scale of one to five, which I am saying beastly to blissful. Can you rate your current, perform current performance results? So for me, and you're going to hear why there are two different practice plans, practicing to learn versus practicing to perform are very different things. So I'd love to hear how you're feeling about your performance. And from Agni, I'm hearing a one, not happy right now. Let's work on that. Joy is giving it a four. Great, pretty happy. Anita is giving it a two, not that thrilled at this moment. Um, Susan's giving it a four. Great. So, so pretty happy. She's not perfectly happy, but she's pretty happy. And let's hear just a little bit more about practice plans. Richard is saying my practice plan is about a three, sometimes a four, if I need to work on something. Okay, so so Richard, are you saying that you can actually get better results if you have uh, if you need to work on something, if you sort of have a, a mission in a way? And Marianne, right now I'm in a one stage of practicing. Yeah, yeah, very very. Very common, you're not alone. You're not alone at all. Um, so uh, Joy is giving her performance a two. Richard, um, I practice more to perform. So that's a three. Practice for general mastery, two. <laughs> okay, great. So it's great to kind of take the temperature and see, see where you guys are at. Um, now, because we're talking about a system, a linear system. You can download the workbook that is part of this system uh, at that address. It's a free workbook. And it reminds you that you want to start with your purpose. And you get in touch with your purpose. From there, you formulate your goals. And all of this is in those trainings, so you can get started on those. Then from those goals, you create your practice plan because the practice plan addresses how to make those goals a reality. So I definitely recommend downloading the workbook right there. Okay, so now let's talk about the difference between mastery and performance. Okay, so when you are practicing for mastery, meaning you are learning the piece or you're learning the ins and outs of the type of improvisation you wanna do, uh, whatever particular goal you have on the harp, so you can see why starting with your goals is so important, from there, you're going to make your plan. Mastery is about getting good at these songs, at these uh, improvisations, at the genres that you're looking at. Mastery is about being able to do the thing and do it consistently. Now, performance is completely different. Performance is where you go out and you share that in usually an unfamiliar environment or definitely not your everyday environment. So it's a very, very different way of being. When you think about how you feel at home, and this is a very common thing that people practice at home and they're doing well and they go to their lesson and it totally falls apart. It's like, what is happening? They feel like they're in a different body. It's simply because they haven't pra practiced performing. So let's think about the way that you practice for mastery, for learning. And I definitely recommend going back and watching the master class on learning because I talked about the three types of memory that you need to really master a piece. So 
if you remember, if you remember, we were talking about um, you can only really hold about five to nine pieces of information in short term memory at any given moment. And so in music, what you're trying to do is bring things from short term memory into long term memory. This requires really drilling down to very small pieces of information, maybe even half a measure. When you think that in a measure you could have one chord has three notes, not only that it has certain duration, not only that it has certain fingering, We're all, we've already reached seven pieces of information with one chord. Now, because you train that in so frequently, you just suddenly know, oh, that's a chord, and it's only one piece of information because it's gone into long-term memory. But it takes a while to transfer things from short-term memory into long-term memory. The more that you can transfer from short-term memory to long-term memory, the more you can memorize and you can kind of bite off bigger chunks of music and they make sense. But think about how much repetition you're doing, how much stopping you're doing, and what tiny chunks you're doing. Now, you go on stage and you just suddenly have to let go of all of that and just play all the way through a piece, come what may. This is the opposite of how we practice for mastery, right? So this is why we really need two entirely different approaches, really different approaches to practice. So again, with the mastery, you know, it's really uh, small chunks, um, repeating many times something goes wrong you stop and you look at it and you're like okay i'm examining this i'm discerning it versus when you're in performance it's like no matter what happens you just keep going because it's all about the flow and the feeling you're not concerned about the mistakes that inevitably crop up that that's not a uh, showstopper literally you know you would just carry on through so I would love to um, share a little bit more about this with you. Uh, I just want to remind you, I'd love you to review that previous masterclass on learning because that is mastery. Um, uh, otherwise, I would repeat the information right now. And I, I just want to be super respectful of your time. We're all super busy. Um, so definitely go back, watch that. That will give you a lot of clues for creating your practice plan for mastery. Um, before I, I move on to practicing to perform, um, can people share with me a little bit about what they're actually doing in their mastery practice plans? Or, and this could perhaps be a better question, are you kind of practicing for mastery and performance at the same time? In other words, do you have one practice plan, one approach? So I'd really like to hear where you are about that before we, we go straight into practicing how to perform. Because I'll tell you, you know, people understand fairly well, uh, you know, after I share this information with them about learning, um, they understand, okay, yes, I have to bring up my auditory memory. Yes, I need to bring up my analytical. Okay, let's get the kinesthetic memory going. They get that. But when it comes to practicing for performance, then they're completely flummoxed. They're like, well, how do I practice for performance except just get on the stage? But by the time you've gotten on the stage, the pressure is so high and you're basically trying to do something with no preparation, with no practice. It's actually quite terrifying. But there are ways to practice for performance before you get on stage. And we'll talk about that. So Raisa is saying at the same, she practices for mastery and performance at the same time, uh, one approach. So Raisa, let, I'm really excited to share this with you today. You know, this pairing out the difference between practicing for mastery and performance because they look opposite. I, I really can't say that often enough, I feel. Um, most of the time people are practicing for mastery and then they get on stage and it feels uncomfortable. So Anita is saying, I am trying to practice both at the same time. I am preparing to record in a studio for a scholarship. Okay, so I think you're going to find this very valuable today, Anita, this information. 
And then Susan says, I try to practice for mastery in small chunks, focusing on the piece in the morning. I try to spend some time in the afternoon just playing through the pieces that I know and perform. So right there, there's an example of having two very different mindsets, two practice plans. Okay, so when we go into the idea of practicing to perform, um, we have already mastered the song at this point. So what does that mean? This means that it's in our auditory memory, it's in our analytical memory, and it's in our kinesthetic memory. Only when a piece has reached this stage, we can bring it over to the performance practice. So we wanna make sure that we're really confident we've got the mastery down first. Mastery is the first step. Okay, so when you're practicing for performance, what you're going to do very much like what Susan said is you actually play through the entire piece, top to bottom, no stops, come what may, doesn't matter what happens. We have to build up the stamina to get all the way through the song because sometimes actually we can run out of energy or focus. So we wanna build up our stamina and our focus. We wanna really get into the arc of the song, the flow of the song. And that will only happen by playing the entire song. You know, I'm a huge fan of looking at these little chunks. Yeah, I'm a maniac about it. But when it comes to the actual performance of the song, it's definitely the entire arc that we care about. We don't care so much about those little individual notes because we have taken care of them. We know that at any moment we can hook right back into very conscious memory and that we have shaped every note and we care about every note and we know every note. In performance though, there's a certain letting go and surrender that has to happen for something magical to happen. So we wanna practice that at home. And we wanna be able to consistently go through the entire piece with no stops and really perceiving the, the narrative, the storyline of the song um, clearly, you know, that we're really connected to it the entire way. So the stamina and focus, and then we have the arc. And the third thing is building up resilience. So by resilience, that means bouncing back from things that go wrong. There are little glitches that happen. A nail will hit, you know, a, a alternate note will show up. An audience member has a coughing fit, a door slams, things happen. And we wanna be able to bounce back from that. So as we're also playing all the way through come what may, we really, really are managing to, to really hook into, into that arc constantly so that when resilience needs to be called into play, when something goes wrong, we can keep the thread going. So I would say a lot of people are afraid of making mistakes on stage. I think that's the fear that they have, um, first and foremost. And by practicing this way for performance, where you're going all the way through with no stops, that will really test that to see, you know, can I actually get through come what may? Can I recover from mistakes? Because all musicians have to recover from mistakes. This, it's a very, very common thing to happen, to make a mistake. Most of the audience members don't know, you know, and, but we get kind of stuck in the past, we're like, I made that mistake. What was it? What did I do it? But the song is going on. <laughs> so for so many reasons, this, this way of practicing all the way through with no stops, that is performing practice. So let me see some comments before I move on. Um, Anita, that is definitely my biggest performance fear. Yes, and you know, it's very, very common. You'll hear this um, probably, I'd say that's a good 90%. Um, people don't necessarily report to me, I'm afraid of sounding boring or I'm afraid of not saying anything. I don't hear that so much. It's just the, the, the basic fear of making a mistake. Now, if you consistently are making the same mistake in a place, that actually means it's not ready for performance practice. It needs to go back into the mastery practice bucket, which is totally fine. It's good information for us to have. It's like, oh, you know what? I actually haven't mastered that piece 100% yet because in this part, I always make a mistake. 
So it's like, thank you for letting me know performance practice. I now return you to mastery practice. So let's see what else we have. We have Marianne saying, practicing for performance for me is about the flow and creative acceptance of the moment with as much mastery as possible. Marianne, that's a beautiful way of putting it. So first and foremost, we need to master the song. And that to me is a very different way of practicing, right? It's very kind of micro practice. You know, we're looking at small details. And then suddenly when we go into the performance mode, as Marianne says, it's much more about this flow, a creative acceptance of the moment. Uh, things happen in that moment. And sometimes you're going to be very pleasantly surprised by what happens in that moment. So you want to be available. Uh, you want to be able to surrender yourself to that moment. Because as I say, magical things can come through at that time. Let's see what Joy says. With mastery, I focus on the notes as written, as well as my timing and my placements. For performance, I look at it as a lead sheet and make sure I know where to substitute an easy chord and come back when lost. Nice. So with the mastery, Joy, what you're saying is that you really focus in on, on the details. You've got the notes as written, so kind of analytical, your timing, which is a combination of the analytical and the auditory, probably the kinesthetic too, really. It's your hands moving. Placements, very kinesthetic. And then for performance, you look at it as a lead sheet. So you almost, uh, I get a visual of like kind of blurring your eyes when you're looking at the um, score and you just kind of see the overall outline. It's like a, a map in a way of, and you see these mountains in the distance. So you have the overall shape in front of you, um, perhaps as an insurance, we could say, um, but you're certainly not focusing on it because when you focus on something written, the visual cortex takes over so much that it diminishes your hearing. Therefore, you won't be able to be as musical because you literally can't hear so well. You can't be so present for the music because you are all about visual at that point. Um, so, Joy, you also have some resilience going on. So you know where to substitute an easy chord and when to come back. So making these types of plans for your performance where you have these starting and stop points, for example, uh, that you know that should a mishap occur, you could return to a certain section. You can pick things up somewhere within the piece, not have to go all the way to the top of the piece again. Superb. Um, so Linda is saying, I'm not as fearful of mistakes as I am of not being able to recover. So when you really lock in your mastery, in other words, when you've got your auditory memory barreling along super strong, you know how the song sounds in your head, you have the analytical memory clear, so you know your form, you know the chords that are coming up, and you also know the dance of your hands, you know your kinesthetic memory, you actually have a huge amount of backup. So the chance of not being able to recover becomes much, much lower. Nonetheless, mastery practice is not enough. We simply also have to do, and we have to experience things going wrong and recovering. We have to practice this recovering. Yeah, it's all very well to know analytically that I can go to this section and it starts with this chord, but what's it like to actually do it? Again, the big difference between intellectually knowing something and actually doing it, right? I mean, we can look at these scores and kind of read them and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I see what's going on. And then you put it in your hands. You're like, whoa, <laughs> that feels different. Um, and sometimes you're surprised. Sometimes the score looks really difficult. It's easy. And then sometimes the opposite. It's like very sparse, but it's like all the shapes are bizarre. So until you actually try it, it's sometimes hard to know. So, uh, so Linda, yes, um, this fear of not being able to recover is definitely addressed when you have a practice plan. So you're, again, your practice plan involves going all the way through with no stops. Um, now, 
a really good point from Raisa. The audience seems to respond more to your reaction to a mistake than the mistake itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. For the most part, when people come to a performance, they want to feel something. They just want to feel something. They don't necessarily want to be impressed or wowed intellectually. They're not there to analyze. They may a little bit go in and out of that sometimes, um, but for the most part, they are there to be moved in some way, to be transported, transformed. So honestly, they're listening more to the arc than every single note. If they are listening very intently to every single note, they probably aren't really surrendered to the experience and they probably aren't really getting the most out of the concert that they could. So Reza, quite right. If we make a funny face <laughs> when we make a mistake, that's often the cue to the audience that something is wrong. Or even if they do hear us make a mistake and we don't really react, there's some amazing research that shows it makes no difference on their assessment of your performance. Uh, if you guys look it up online, um, I'll try and find the link of this research. It was really amusing to me and very heartening. So, yeah, it's oftentimes that we have the worst fears going on um, than could ever transpire in real life. So Richard is asking a very practical question. So in performance practice, do you still count the beats in your head or is it just an automatic flow? For me, Richard, what I am feeling is very much the pulse of the music. I feel that it's it's basically, you know, a very primal thing that I'm absolutely connected to. If I'm counting the beats in my head, it's a little bit too cerebral. If, however, I have a very long pause, I may count, not, not metronomically, but one, two, Bam, and then I come back in. I may count if it's a very long pause because when we're performing, our adrenaline goes up and our perception of time changes. We actually perceive time as going slower, weirdly enough. Um, and so what we'll tend to do is we're playing along, you know, one, two, three, hold, two, three, bam, we cut it short. You know, our perception of time becomes thrown off. So if there's a very long pause, Richard, I will tend to count out very subtly. But otherwise, I am trying to go with the flow, but always connected with some sort of pulse. I want to feel that pulse for sure. I try not to let it go absolutely automatic pilot. Uh, because again, the adrenaline factor can throw things off. Um, let me know a little bit more about this question, if you would, because have you experienced that, that when you're performing, you, you find you do still need to count the beats? Or do you find that you tend to rush in performance, which is so common? It's just adrenaline. Um, Susan says, learning to deal with distractions while performing is a challenge. Okay, thank you. So let's talk about that. One of the ways to practice for performance is to literally set up distractions. And it could be having a friend, you know, make noises in the room. It could be having your timer on your phone set to go off two minutes within your piece. You're basically learning, you know, the, the Zen master practice of focus that no matter what is going on, bar an earthquake, which happened at the last Facebook Live, and I still sat in my seat anyway, um, you're going to keep on focusing because honestly that, that someone else is making a noise is really nothing you can do to control that. So dealing with distractions, um, you could go practice in a public place. Parks are great uh, because they're, they make, there's so much going on. People are going by on bicycles and dogs and things like that. Um, practicing in hospitals has been a great way for me to deal with distractions. I mean, literally people will come up and talk to you while you're playing. And I learned how to, you know, <laughs> smile and nod, mm -hmm. even say a few things. I can't carry on an entire conversation. Uh, so you do want to look for distractions. You want to set up these distractions because honestly, they are going to happen. 
So Susan, can you let us know a little bit about how you've been dealing with distractions as you perform? Because I know, um, I know you do perform. And Mia says, would that work if you can't see to read music or not? Um, can you tell me a little bit more, uh, a little bit more about your question? Um, I mean, I certainly feel that people uh, can do mastery practice without knowing how to read Western notation. Absolutely. I mean, given the entire world, most people don't read Western notation and they certainly play music all over the world. So your auditory memory doesn't require reading. Your analytical memory doesn't require reading. I mean, you can say I'm in this key, but that doesn't mean you have to know how to read. Uh, you can say I'm using these chords. Again, you don't know how to read, have to know how to you don't have to know how to read. And then the kinesthetic memory is entirely kinesthetic, definitely not reading. So all of mastery practice can be done uh, without actually knowing how to read Western notation to, you know, read music. And Rima says, yes, when I feel my music, I do much better. Yeah, yeah. So being inside, inside your music and being able to let go because you've mastered it, then performance goes so much better, so much better. Um, Joy saying, great point about what an audience member wants. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that previous comment. Um, and again, you know, we can't actually control our audiences. So whatever they want, in a way, we have to kind of let go of that and just recenter in our purpose and know that we've done our mastery practice, we've done our performance practice, and we're just offering, offering this music. I mean, we actually can't control what they think. Perhaps we play a song that brings back a horrible memory to them and they say, I hate that, harpist. <laughs> but it wasn't you. I mean, yeah, so that's kind of another topic, but yeah. And uh, let's take another comment. Susan says, when playing short pieces, I tend to play them more than once in performance. When I start performing a new piece, often I seem to get lost somewhere the second time through. Playing it through several times in practice helps me let go of internal distractions. External distractions, of course, are always a surprise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So very good point from Susan. So... When you practice in performance, for performance, um, what I highly recommend is you play the piece as you will play it in performance. So if you're going to do three repeats, do the three repeats at home. Don't wait until you're on stage to say, oh, I just know I'm going to repeat it again. No, you want to know exactly how it feels to repeat it again. Don't leave that up to chance. So if you're playing an entire concert, that, of course, means playing the whole concert from start to finish during your performance practice because you want to know how does the flow of the entire p concert feel? How's my stamina going? And you may also get some insights about your programming and say, oh, you know what? That song at that certain point in the concert doesn't quite feel right. I want to move it around a little bit. You'll only know that by actually playing the entire thing. So Anita says, I was on my patio and a small child two doors down starts calling for his mom. It took everything I had to stay in the flow. Good performance practice. Nice. <laughs> and um, Susan is telling us a little bit more about how she's playing. I play in an assisted living center. Often there are people coming and going. I'm getting better at continuing to focus regardless of what's happening. At the park today, oh, you played in the park today. I had a group of kids sitting entranced, which was a different and very fun distraction. Fabulous. So in order to practice performance, we have to perform. So I talked about going all the way through the piece as you intend to perform it with all the feeling that you intend to express in the performance as well. And then in terms of the actual sort of exposure factor, the, the way of exposure is basically normalizing performance, making performance a normal thing to do. 
I mean, because many of us will drive around, for example, and that's inherently much more dangerous than playing the harp. But we'll be more scared about playing the harp in public than we will about driving, you know, a 2,000 pound lethal weapon down the road. Um, <laughs> and a lot of it is because, you know, we have practiced that driving. We uh, When we first started, we probably were a bit nervous, but because of the exposure, it became normal. It's a normal thing to do now. Okay. So how to get performance experience uh, off the stage? My favorite tool is your phone. Film yourself on the phone. Turn on that video. And while you're doing your performance practice, have the video rolling. Having this electronic eye on you can be surprisingly stressful. And it's very good exposure. Exposure training. Now, does it mean exposure to the world? No, you can, of course, erase the video. You don't even have to watch the video. It's more the act of dealing with the eye on you and learning, you know what? I actually can't really control that eye, no matter what happens. All I can control is what I'm doing. So this is training you basically for that concept that, you know, we can't actually control our audiences. All we can do is be in a place of strength and beauty and share that. And that brings them along on that journey. So the phone, incredible way to practice performing. Have, have any of you tried that? Um, I have found that people honestly get quite nervous dealing with it. Um, so, yeah, Gloria says... Yes, the phone works. Believe me, I use it frequently to get used to and immune to something watching me. Thank you. Beautiful. Absolutely right. Uh, Bethany, I joined an organization that assigns places around town for street performance. It has helped me tremendously with playing through distractions. Yeah. So besides playing for your phone at home, you can take your harp out in, in kind of a noisy environment is, you know, with distractions and things like that. Uh, I highly recommend that. And it can really bring up so many joyous encounters, to say the least. It's also tremendous performance practice. Now, say you kind of want to up the ante a little bit. I really recommend having a Skype harp buddy. Or if you have a harp buddy in town, get together and play for each other. But with Skype, you know, any harpist can be only, a, you know, a call away. And so as you play for each other, again, you normalize the experience of performing. They say, and I don't know how true it is, but, you know, it certainly can't hurt, that before you go on stage, you want to have performed your piece at least 10 times. And that, that doesn't mean simply mastery practice. It means really going through your piece all the way, totally in flow with some type of audience, whether that be a phone, whether that be your Skype heart buddy, whether it be going out to your local park or to um, the street uh, street performances that Bethany mentioned. Um, going through 10 of those experiences will, will normalize performing. Now, notice how different this is from mastery practice. Now, let's get back to our topic, the, the why you need two different practice plans. This is why. Can you see how different this is from mastery? If you only did play it all the way through, no matter what happens, you know, go and do that for your phone. Um, you wouldn't master anything. You really have to do the mastery part first. So again, this really big separation. And I'll tell you, you know, I think a lot of my former performance anxiety came from really never doing performance practice at all and then getting on stage in a high stakes environment. I mean, really worst case scenario, horrible. Now that I look back, I'm like, oh, how painful. I feel bad for myself. Um, but uh, I was basically practicing to perform on stage. That was my practice because I hadn't done that, except you know, periodically when I would have to perform, that I would practice it, but it was on stage. 
And it's just too much pressure. It's too traumatic. So let's see anything else I want to say to you. Yes. Um, I'd like to return to the big picture. When you're practicing for performance, you want to return to your purpose. So as you are practicing to perform, you're in touch with your mission, your greatest reason for playing harp. Now you are in touch with it when you're doing mastery practice as well, but it's not quite as clear because you're, you're kind of more wrapped up in, is that an E chord or which fingering should I use? I mean, your purpose isn't necessarily first and foremost in your mind at that moment, but when you're practicing to perform, you're right in there in your mission. And so you're also practicing that uh, vision that you have. And that greatly reduces performance anxiety too because you're in touch with something much bigger than a mistake here and there. Who cares about that mistake? It's really this important thing that you're sharing that you are in touch with. And that is what, that's the gift that you're offering your audience at that moment. So practice in being in touch with your purpose as you work through your performance practice at the same time. So Susan says, there is a piece that I had mastered and haven't played for a month or so. Later this month, I'll perform it in church with someone singing, which is new for me. I played it through to listen to see if any parts are shaky and need more mastery focus before I perform. Yes. So you want to give yourself some time to reside in this performance practice mode. So get it into mastery. But again, for instance, I mentioned that 10 times through perform something 10 times through in practice mode before you go on stage, definitely give yourself uh, a nice chunk of time. I would, I would like ideally um, for some, for a piece to be uh, completely done in mastery mode at least three weeks before performance. Now it could be two weeks, I could live with that, but I just want, want to give you a lot of time to reside in this performance practice mode because it's a very, very different way of being as we can see. So how do you think you are going to use these ideas? How are you going to utilize this big difference between a mastery practice plan and a performance? practice plan. Uh, what changes do you think you might make? Um, I'd love to hear what's what's being sparked for you right now uh, about new ways that you can approach your practice so that you get not only better results of your mastery, you learn better because you're more clearly studying the learning aspect and not just sort of playing through the piece numerous times, kind of hoping it'll get better. So You'll get better at learning, and then you'll also get better at performing. Both of them become much stronger. So Richard says, visualizing a projection of intention and the energy flow out and back during performance and practice is helpful for me. Yes, R Richard, you know I'm a huge fan of the seven steps of centering. And uh, that seventh step is exactly that. And I use it every single time I perform. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. So, so yeah, let me know if there are any um, specific things that you're going give to a, give a try that are a little bit different based on what you've heard today. So changing up your, your practice routine a little bit so that you get clearer. Am I learning right now or am I, am I practicing to perform? And just while you're thinking about that, um, just let me show you the, the workbook again. So that's harpcircleworkbook.com. Just visit there and you can download the free workbook that will keep you on track with this system so that you um, can kind of see the, the plan behind it all. You know, the idea that we start with step one, purpose. The next thing is goals. Then you hit practice plan. <laughs> Roberta, I feel your pain. I must give up my last minute cramming before a performance. Right. You know, it uh, it doesn't give 
yourself enough time to learn the performance ropes, right? If you're cramming in the last minute, it's basically like learning a song in the last minute. Like when you try to learn a song in the last minute, you know that you don't have the luxury to kind of sink into the song and really feel it. And, and you want to do that for performance as well. You want to give yourself a nice run up of time where you're just going through the flow and you're not afraid of making a mistake because you're so close to performance state. Instead, you're like, oh, am I consistently making a mistake there? Oh, I need to do a little mastery on this. Or oh, that was just a glitch. I'm working on my resilience. I'm barreling through. <laughs> yeah. And Carla, mastery of a piece will help eliminate performance anxiety when I play in public. Absolutely. No question about it. And then Richard says, that is key. Asking the question, what kind of practice am I doing? And have I done enough mastery practice? Thank you. Yes, Richard, fabulous question. Yes, ask that question. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, Ginny is sharing with us. After choking on my first recital with my fellow students, I subject my family to listening to my performance as if it's a real performance. I also have my teachers sit across from me and I play my songs as if it's a real performance, which it is. And both situations have helped me with nerves. I appreciate the suggestion of playing in a park. Yeah, Jenny, good work. Uh, Jenny, when you were doing that and when you continue to do that, this is performance practice. And I recommend doing this um, consistently. You know, it will always make you feel confident to know that you're doing performance practice. And then you get on stage, you, you're like, I've got this. I've done my performance practice so that you're not practicing performance on stage. <laughs> yeah, Jenny, you did just the right thing. I love it. Um, so just to recap for everybody, uh, the overall path is purpose first, goal second. Remember, the goals come from the purpose. And then you create your practice plan based on what goals you've chosen for yourself. So that's the trajectory. And Anita says, I'm definitely going to use the phone more. Yeah, another use for our phones. I love it. After hearing everything, it seems that to do both in one, it seems I do both in one practice. I think I think that's what you mean. Uh, if I'm playing through and find a shaky part, I go back and get into the meat of it to correct the issue. Yes. So in a way, mastery practice is like a filter and so things need to go through the mastery filter and make it all the way through before they can go into the practice uh performance practice mode <laughs> good 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 okay i'm excited to hear about what results you guys get from this um you know it's really revolutionized not only my results um and my confidence but it's also made things more fun because I was more able to know where I was at, you know, I knew when I was in mastery. And so then I could kind of enjoy the learning process, or I knew I was in performance mode, and I could enjoy the flow. So it really had that motivation aspect as well. So today, we've been talking about why you need two different practice plans. I would love to know if you have any questions about this. Um, has everything been clear about why you actually need these two different approaches? And as Susan mentioned, she does those two different approaches at different practice times of day. Um, you may find that really helps you uh, to have sort of um, a different mindset in a way, uh, because they are different types of focus. I would say mastery is, you know, this very focused, um, practical way of being. And then the performance is more going into what they call right brain, although there's a lot of controversy about that, but more sort of a intuitive sense of things. Um, so, yeah, I, I hope that was really, really clear to you. Um, on Thursday, we're going to talk about inspiration. Because although this five-step path we've been talking about today, and we're on step three, is linear on the inside of the system, the Bright Knowledge system, you can see these five simultaneous 
essential elements of daily practice. And so far, we've already covered artistry, technique, and learning. Inspiration comes next. And my special guest is Natalia Mann of New Zealand and Australia. She lives, she comes from both places. And uh, she's a very inspiring harpist. Uh, I thought she'd be perfect to share with. So it'll be um, a masterclass with her on Thursday, 4 p.m. Pacific time, which I think is like 9 or 10 a.m. her time. She lives in Kearns, Kearns. <laughs> she lives, I think, on the Gold Coast. It's called Beautiful Place. Um, so look forward to that. And if you um, if you want to get notifications about these upcoming Facebook Lives, uh, be sure to like the Diana Rowan Bright Knowledge Academy page, and then you automatically get notifications like of when I'm going live. So then you won't miss them. And... I think also possibly if you like the Virtual Harp Summit Facebook page, it's the same story. If you like that, you'll also get notifications about these Facebook Lives. And do share this with uh, other harpists if you think um, the information would be useful. It actually also works for other instrumentalists, of course, and singers too. Um, the This idea about the two different practice plans. So... Let's see a few more comments. Mary is saying, I'm going to try using the phone to record. Super, super, super. Um, Carla says, when do you suggest a transition from mastery to performance? Sorry, I came in late. No, no worries. <laughs> um, and by the way, people, you can always watch the replay. Um, obviously, I won't be live to answer questions, but uh, I can oftentimes answer them in the comments later. So, uh, Carla, you know when something is mastered, when it's deeply in your auditory memory, you can sing it from beginning to end with no blank spots. When you have a clear sense of the analytical aspect of the song, you know your key, you know what chords are made up of it, you know the form that it's in, and your kinesthetic memory is, is solid. You know how your hands are moving. Now, this is in an ideal world, of course. Sometimes we don't have time to get something that in, deeply into our mastery, but that is our, our goal. Sometimes, you know, just a performance is coming up and you've got to play the thing. Um, so sometimes we do have to make a compromise. I will admit that. Uh, but in an ideal world, you move on to performance when the piece is memorized or extremely familiar you know, that you're not actually reading the page or figuring out fingering, you know, at that moment, you're too distracted. So I hope that is, um, that's helpful to you. Uh, definitely being able to play through the piece um, from beginning to end uh, smoothly and um, with no consistent mistakes. I mean, it's okay if mistakes creep in, but if it's a consistent mistake, again, that does mean you have to go back and take another look at, at that spot. Um, so I hope that is uh, helpful. Cool, glad to hear it. All right. Um, and Gloria's saying, can't wait for the inspiration session. Yes. Uh, oh, good, I'm glad you found today helpful, Gloria. And, and let me know, as always, guys, I love to hear your results and I do, I do read them all. I do follow up. On, on what we've got going on, because um, as you learn this material, uh, I deepen how much um, how much it works. You know, I see which aspects are working the very best because I'm always refining. You know, it's like any piece of music. You know, you refine, you refine. There's always layers. There's a piece I'm playing on the piano right now that I played as a teenager. You know, and I'm I'm looking at that again and adding. I'm seeing so many more layers to it, you know, because now I have a few more decades of perspective. Yeah. Sally is saying, I love to practice in the park. I've done it a couple of times before outdoor weddings. Superb. So that is definitely performance practice. And it's fun, you know, it's fun and everybody loves it. You know, everybody, everybody wins in this. So, oh, Sandra. You have inspired me to practice more. Good, good. I, I hope you enjoy it more. You know, I I think um, when we apply these kinds of principles to our practice, it just does become more fun. And so then you want to do it, right? 
<laughs> yeah. Great. Well, guys, I am going to uh, sign off. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Melinda. Um, always great. Great to have you. Um, and yeah, I'll see you on Thursday. Remember to catch up with the replays um, because actually the replays are showing you um, the bones of this uh, bright knowledge system. So, um, so try not to miss any of them because each of them has a very important sort of piece, piece of this, uh, this tasty pie. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, good. Richard, I'm so pleased. Um, yeah, great. And, and again, guys, always let me know about your results. I want to hear how this actually works for you, works for you in the field, you know? Yeah. Anita, you're very welcome. Thank you for being here. And yeah, Bethany, great. I'm glad you came in and uh, yeah, uh, go back and watch the beginning. I get it. Lovely. Marianne, what a, a delight to know about these two practice strategies. Great. This has been extremely motivating and inspirational for me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you guys inspire me. Yeah, because you know, the more that you are in touch with, you know, what you really care about, your purpose in life, I just think that energy that radiates out you know, and, and becomes incredibly healing and uplifting thing for all of us, even if you practice alone in your room, you know, that you're engaging in this energy. I do believe in that butterfly effect, you know, that it's, it's coming out. So, um, so yeah, you, you are motivating me as well. Yeah. So I'm going to sign off for now. Um, Yes, thank you, Agne. Together we are stronger. We are. Yeah, yeah. This is the new, the new way. You know, this is the age where we share information, and we know it lifts us all up, makes us all stronger. Um, it's a good thing. So, yay. Okay. Well, I'll see you on Thursday. Uh, watch the replays if you get a chance, and of course, there'll be a replay of Thursday. So, bye for now, guys.